Hello, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome to the Horological Society of New York. It is great to see so many people here for our December 2023 meeting, our last meeting of the year, so welcome. My name is Nicholas Manousis. I'm the executive director here at HSNY, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you. Let's get started with a few announcements as usual. So education updates. December, we're taking it easy. We're not traveling anywhere, which is quite all right. We've had a very busy travel schedule throughout the, uh, the rest of the year. But we do have our New York evening classes available throughout the month. And we have our uh, uh, one weekend class scheduled uh, coming up on December 9th. So take, take a look. If you haven't uh, taken one of our classes yet, you should, you should try them out. OK, so on to something kind of special, something that I've been waiting a while to, uh, to announce here tonight. Maybe you had a chance to, to sample the fragrance uh, uh, here at the front of the room before we got started. But tonight, we are announcing a product that we've been working on for almost a year now in, in the background, and it's something kind of different, something kind of, kind of new. It's a fragrance. So it's a fragrance inspired by Herology. So what, what is that all about? It's kind of it's crazy to think about, uh, but there's a lot to it. And I'm going to introduce my, my good friend, Joey Rosen. He's our perfumer who developed the, uh, the fragrance for us, and he's going to come up and, and talk about what went into it. Thank you, Nick. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm, my name is Joey. I designed this beautiful fragrance um, for the Orological Society. Um, when they originally approached me to design it, um, a lot of ideas, like how do we make time into a perfume? Is it going to smell like an old book because it's a library? Like, what are we doing? But as we, we thought of it and as we talked, um, a lot of parallels between olfaction and smell and watchmaking and time sort of came into view. So um, the idea is something that changes as you wear it. So like we put a watch on our wrist to track time with our eyes, we can also put a perfume on our wrist and track time with our nose. Um, I designed it to be very wearable. I know that we're maybe not all a fragrance wearing audience and uh, patrons of the Orological Society, but it's comfor comfortable for everybody. Guy, girl, man, woman, maybe not kids, but it's, it's good for everybody. Um, it has notes of bergamot, bitter orange, alpine air to recall Orology's Swiss roots. Um, when, after that dries down, you get into cedarwood, orange blossom, and praline like the nut cart down the street. Um, that's our New York City street moment. You have amber, tobacco, and supple leather, we're calling a watch band in the base. It's super great, I'm super proud of it. We have the whole team here, um, me and my business partner Zoe, and the designer of this wonderful box that looks like a book, and the bottle, Cristobal is here, so find us afterwards, ask us questions, and more than anything, um, consider picking one up for the holidays and impressing your uh, friends and family with the scent of the season. Thank you, Joey. All right, thank you, thank you, Joey. Uh, got a couple more product shots here. Really nice photography. I wonder who took these these beautiful photos. I think he's sitting right there. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, so we've got the the full size and the sample size. And uh, it's available now on our website. And it's also available here tonight after the lecture. We have our little holiday pop-up shop in the back there. And Carolina is manning it. Uh, all right. So enough of my sales pitch. Uh, just had to get that out there. Tonight, uh, we're, going to, we're going to talk about something a little bit different. So the value of time, branding, and effective storytelling and watchmaking. Marketing is important. Because at the end of the day, uh, we, uh, we're making watches to, to, to sell them. Uh, it's a business. So you've got to let people know what it is you're trying to sell. And there are different ways that you can think about selling luxury items. Uh, history is, a, is an important selling, uh, selling tool or marketing tool when it comes to luxury items. Case in point. 30 seconds ago, I was talking to you about our fragrance, and it's named 1866 after the year we were founded. So I was trying to 
impress everyone with some of our history uh, to sell you a, a fragrance. And the same thing happens every day with, uh, with marketing luxury items, marketing uh, luxury watches. And tonight, that's what we're going to take a, a close look at. Uh, so our speaker for this evening is the founder and owner of uh, Gigantum uh, PR Agency, uh, and she's an absolute expert on the subject. Please join me in welcoming Fernanda Zapata. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, you know, I think in PR we're used to putting other people in the spotlight, not necessarily us being in front of everybody, uh, so bear with me, you know, throughout the presentation. Um, I think value of time is, is so relative. Um, it, it really is a matter of perspective, and it's, a, it's really a valuation of each person's um, significance to a particular object or experience, um, and that's really what I want to talk about today. Um, I wouldn't necessarily refer to this as selling, it's more about patronage, um, in my opinion. Uh, not just in, because it's a luxury item, but everything that you do, whether you're buying a coffee, whether you're going to a restaurant, you are supporting an artist in their, in their own way, right? Like the clients that support us, they're supporting our art and storytelling as well. Um, so I think that's a, an important distinction. This is me. Uh, I am not doing this just so you can see how cute I was as a baby, because I really was really cute. Um, I think what's really important to highlight is that at the end of the day, everything we do is about people. This is me and my sister. I have to put an embarrassing picture of her somewhere because this is what she looks like today, so I have to, you know, bring back the old school stuff to embarrass her a little bit. So again, it's about people. What are my values? What do I care about? Uh, who am I? Uh, I'm Mexican. I'm an immigrant. Uh, some people have said I'm hardworking, fun, uh, empathetic. Some people have said that I crack the whip at work. If you ask my team who's in the audience, they might agree with you on that. <laughs> but at the end of the day, what we value in things, for me at least, uh, really comes down to three things. What do we invest our energy? our time, and our money on. Product, people, anything that we do. It sets a lot about who we are. Now, I'm preaching to the choir here, but this is probably one of the most iconic advertising campaigns in the luxury watch industry. Um, what do you think about when you see it? What does it make you feel? Oh, there we go, somebody's wearing a watch. <laughs> to me, this means legacy. And I think it's something that, especially for the watch industry, but for us as human beings, it's extremely important uh, throughout life. We always think about what are we leaving behind, uh, whether that's family, whether that's what we do for a living, whether that's the relationships and the people that we touch. Legacy. Red lips. <laughs> the lipstick effect. It's probably one of the most um, important pieces of, of information that I ever walked away with from a marketing degree, which... If anybody in this room knows anybody thinking about studying marketing, maybe cajole them in a different direction. I think that marketing is, to a certain degree, something that you experience. Um, now the red lip. I see a lot of ladies in the room, which I'm really happy to see. What do you think about when you think about red lipstick? I put it on tonight. I want it to feel powerful. That's what it means to me. Um, what does it mean to you, right? At the end of the day, that's what we're here for. De Beers, a diamond is forever. That was the original campaign in 1947 that basically changed the entire diamond industry and created the engagement ring as we know it today. Nature's mic drop, a direct response to the lab-grown diamond industry. Diamond industry. Not only do you have to stay true to your original values, but you also have to evolve with market perception and the industry that you're in um, and answer new questions that come up with technology, innovation, and again, just perception of the product that you're selling. Chocolate abuelita. <laughs> if any Latin people are in the room, this is what you grow up drinking, Christmas, Dia de los Reyes, King's Day in January. Um, 
it, it means home, right? That's what it means to me. Now, what do all of these have in common? They create an emotion connection. And that really is at the heart of what good marketing and good storytelling does. 1866, great example. When I first smelled the scent that Nick showed to me when we first had that conversation about this talk, I immediately thought about my grandfather sitting in a study with his pocket watch, smoking a pipe, and his little glass of bourbon. So I invite you at the end of this lecture to just go s smell it one more time and just close your eyes and think about what it evokes. Especially fragrance, I think, is such a unique um, uh, product that brings in even more emotion than most products out there. So before we continue, I will ask you to look at these brands, some of the biggest names in the industry, and just think about what do they mean to you? What do they evoke in you? What words come to mind when you see these logos? And before we even go any further, I would ask you to think about what is time to begin with? What is the value of time? Each person will have a completely different answer. Um, and I think, again, that goes back to that individuality and brands properly connecting with people. What are these different emotions that everybody has when thinking about time, when thinking about watches? It's all connected. Now, again, it's about people, right? And it's about who we are and how do you connect with everybody. So for example, for me, anybody here interested in astrology? Show of hands, anybody? Okay. You guys are looking at me like, what is she talking about? What does this have to do with watches? I'm a Pisces sun. I'm a Capricorn moon. What does that mean? It means I'm a romantic. It means I'm super analytical as well. Um, to me, that's why watches make sense. I mean, if you think about it, what is time, right? It's this human construct that we just randomly one day decided that we needed to measure. And then we went into some benches somewhere and decided to create these machines that keep track of time. How, how beautiful and romantic is that? I honestly can't think of anything more. You can't buy time. It's the one thing you can't buy. To measure that is, to me, just really, truly beautiful. Maybe you can't buy love, but some people would argue otherwise. So, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide on that. So when we think, again, about the value of time, what do we invest our energy, our time, and our money in? And when brands talk to the end client, we have to think not only about what you as customers are looking for, but we have to think about what do we stand for? Where do we invest energy, time, and money? And when those two come together, well, that's where the magic happens, right? That's what we call matchmaking. Now, who here is familiar with the story of Charles Vermont and the Zenith El Primero movement? Show of hands. OK, I see you. I know you do. <laughs> so. This is a particularly beautiful story, in my opinion. Charles, uh, you know, during the quartz crisis, um, the, the company had been bought by a certain group that did not believe in mechanical watchmaking anymore. And they said, get rid of El Primero. Get rid of anything that has to do with mechanical watchmaking. We're going to move on to quartz. Um, and Charles said, you know, I, I don't believe this is the right path. And as you can see in this video, he wrote a very extensive letter and tried to make a case for it. Um, unfortunately, the brand did not listen. So instead, for years, he, at night, would go to the attic and put away, piece by piece, all the tools, all the molds, all the different elements to create the El Primero movement. And he hid it in the attic and even created a, uh, a false wall so that they didn't know that it was up there. His wife, at a point, thought he was having an affair. No joke. Um, because he would hide and he didn't tell a single soul until the day came that certain brands came knocking on the door asking for that specific movement. This is a video that plays in the attic. If anybody goes to the Zenith manufacturer, you can actually see the attic. You, there's a video playing, this video playing. I have seen grown men cry when they watch this. 
I will admit, I cried the first time I saw it. This is a man that dared to dream. He dared to defy the company that was giving him his job, his livelihood, his family's livelihood, because he believed in something far greater than himself. Again, it's about people. And thankfully to him, we will forever owe him a watchmaking debt of gratitude for saving the El Primero movement. Now, this goes back to messaging. You know, what do we stand for as a brand? Sometimes that conversation is emotional. And I think I have to play with this. I don't know where the cursor is. There we go. Another very impressive campaign, in my opinion. Again, speaking to that emotional connection that you can make with somebody in such a short amount of time. Uh, but sometimes it's not all about emotion, right? Sometimes. Sometimes it's also about humor. At the end of the day, messages have to resonate. They have to be remembered. It's not just, again, about what you say, it's how you say it. That also really matters. You have to connect with someone that has those similar values. Um, and it has to say something about you as a brand. What are you trying to express to other people? What are you trying to get them to understand about you? Now, just based on this one video alone, what does age most value? And, and feel free to just, you know, internally answer that question. Feel free to, you know, later on uh, express your own opinions. To me, it means they're creative. It means that they're innovative. It means that they appreciate mechanics beyond just technology uh, from a digital standpoint. Uh, they respect tradition, uh, but they also have their unique perspective. And from even just the first messages that you see from the beginning, they appreciate connection beyond a text message, beyond being bothered with notifications when you're out for drinks with friends. They appreciate that one-on-one -on -one conversation. That's what that means to me. Now, I think one important thing to, to highlight is that in order to have effective marketing and storytelling, you have to think about the different ways in which people appreciate a particular product or service. Watches are more about, not just watches, right? They're also about design, they're about craftsmanship, they're about technology, or they're about innovation. Innovation. I see some faces, I see some people cringing. It's a quartz movement, right? They're like, eh, we're in the wrong place. <laughs> I'm about to get canceled. Quartz crisis, at the end of the day, was a part of the history of watchmaking. We owe a lot to the fact that that happened. Michel Parmigiani would never have gone into restoration if he hadn't encountered the quartz crisis after he graduated from watchmaking school. You have to remember at the time this was extremely innovative. It was about the quest for precision in watchmaking innovation. Who knows what we'll encounter in 100, 200 years? The Apple Watch. I've been asked so many times, and I'm sure everybody in this room have, has heard the question of, is this a threat to watchmaking? It's not. 
In my opinion, it's new eyes, new wrists for us to dress. Let's bring them on over. Well, eventually, this thing's going to die, and they're going to look at us. So please, the more the merrier. And now just to redeem myself a little bit. <laughs> Group of Force. I mean, who does not admire and appreciate a quadruple inclined tourbillon with a rotating globe and GMT function? I mean, that's a mouthful. A tourbillon wasn't complicated enough for them, so they're like, let's just spice it up a little bit. The other thing, for example, uh, Gerard Perigo's continued quest for constant escapement innovation. <laughs> Fun fact, I actually had the pleasure of launching the original watch in 2013 and then again be part of the launch of this new um, evolved piece uh, this year as well. It's such a beautiful and unusual um, honor to be able to see something come out full circle. Uh, you know, it's not often that brands work with one agency or one person in particular for an extended period of time. Um, and granted, there was a gap in our relationship with GP. We'll forgive them for that. but. They came back, they, they knew it was good. Um, but it was, it was so nice to see the beginning and now the second chapter. I'm not gonna say the end because I'm sure there's more in the works. Um, but it's, it's such a beautiful watch. I would highly recommend uh, you guys go check it out if, if you have the opportunity. Now here's a special piece that most of you in this room probably haven't seen. This was launched today. Uh, the Parmigiani Fleurier, one of a kind, I'm gonna butcher this, L'Armorial pocket watch. Uh, it was launched today to uh, celebrate Michelle Parmigiani's birthday, which was on Saturday, December 2nd. Uh, wh what a beautiful mind uh, that man has. The, it was a project that required the combined work of what Parmigiani calls the Golden Hands Team. And that refers to just master experts in different crafts. So you have master engravers Eddie Jacquet and Christophe Blandenier. You have master enameler, Vanessa Lecce, who is a wonderful human being. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to visit her workshop uh, in Switzerland, I would highly recommend it. Master chain maker, Laurent Joliet, uh, somebody that literally spent over a year, I think it was two years, to create the perfect chain that didn't just you know, bend in the right way, but that when you drop it on the table, it's fluid. Can you imagine that level of detail? It's insane. I mean, of course you can. You're, you're into watches. <laughs> and then you have, of course, the incredible movement, the PF993, which is a chronograph with a minute repeater and a perpetual calendar with a moon face. Again, another mouthful. So sometimes the product can, can speak for itself. But here we're talking about also art. That's another layer, right? There's mechanics, and then there's art. Mechanics are their own form of art, but this is a little bit more on the traditional side. A Crivia. I will never forget the first time I saw those dials. Um, I want to say it was like 2017 Watch Time New York, and I'd never heard of them. And they had a tiny little booth in a corner, um, and just getting to see them in person. I mean, pictures do not do it justice. Um, definitely, if you have a chance to see it in person, please do. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you about longest finishing. Right? Perfection down to the smallest detail. I mean, that's watchmaking also, right? If you think about the size of the different elements of a watch, again, romantic. And sometimes it can be just about aesthetics and design. Now, this is, this is my grail watch. If I could, I would. Christmas is around the corner. My birthday's in March. If anybody wants to you know, start a petition around, I will take it. 
Now, I like it not because of the people that wear it. I have no idea who that guy in the middle is. I really don't. I just found this on Google. Um, but I love the watch. Don't ask me why. I just love it. And I actually have purposely not looked a lot into it because I don't want to know. I just know that I like it. And that's all that matters. Now, messaging via PR, advertising, it's all great and good. At the end of the day, we also have to connect with people. Like today, we're here in person. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> I know December gets busy for everybody. Um, but it's about connecting with people one-on-one -on -one as much as possible um, and, and hearing those stories and what, it, what brought you into this world and why do you wear what you wear. Um, and it's about creating experiences. I put this uh, slide more towards the end because you have to make sure that it, it is all connected, right? Um, just like a watch, just like a movement, one thing goes into another and eventually keeps track of time. Same with marketing, it all has to make sense. One thing has to speak to the other. So this particular event um, was something that we did in 2017 with Mido and they were launching this watch inspired by the Guggenheim architecture. Um, and the ask was, how do we create an event that speaks to uh, the design of the watch? And how do you do something that's going to be memorable and people are actually going to want to be a part of? And it's not just your typical you know, champagne toast and <laughs> it's so nice to see you. Um, so we created this concept, uh, aerialist performance, and you have no idea how difficult it was to create that spider looking contraptor and put it in the middle of the Guggenheim. <laughs> Fun fact, there's actually no foundation underneath that area, so if too much weight could actually collapse. Just so you know, I learned that the hard way. Um, but it was about like bringing the attention to the architecture of the space and then tying it back to the watch itself. So if you, if you notice that part um, of the video, the, the central flower vase in each of the tables was actually hollow and then you lifted it for the unveiling and the watch was there and like, the element of surprise for everybody was like, oh wow, we've never seen anything like this. And that's what you want, right? You want people to remember the product, you want people to remember the experience, you want to make people remember what you stand for. And when all of those things come together, that is effective marketing, branding, and storytelling. So if I can find my cursor, that would be great. Ah, where are we? There we go. What is the value of time? In my opinion, the most effective campaigns are going to be the ones that connect emotionally with people. And you don't need to connect with everyone. Depending on the brand, maybe you only make 100 watches a year, maybe you make 1,500. You only have to connect with the right people and the right way. It's about connecting about what your ethos and values are. Tell them about your design, your art, and your craftsmanship. And you're putting your money where your, where your mouth is, right? You're, in the same way that a client is a patron of your product, you are a patron of the artisans that you employ. It's about mechanical innovation and precision. It's about immersive experiences. There are so many different roads to this little world of ours. And every single one is equally valid. 
I don't care if you got here because you were wearing an Apple watch one day and then you got sick of it. I don't care if it's because you saw a celebrity wearing that watch and then you decided that you loved it. At the end of the day, we all love it for one reason or another, and that's what brings us all together. That's what makes this community so interesting. So at the end of the day, it's all about people. I have to embarrass my sister a couple more times. She's gonna watch this and she's gonna kill me, but she's not here, so she can't do anything about it. <laughs> so I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but I'm just gonna bring it back to the same three things that we talked about earlier. Where do we invest our energy? Where do we invest our time? And where do we invest our money? Now, this collection doesn't have to make sense to anyone but me. Um, these are all my watches. Again, they don't necessarily make a lot of sense. To the outsider eye, we have my grandfather's pocket watch. One of my cousins had it first, and then when I started working in the watch industry, my dad had to go talk to my aunt, basically steal it back and give it to me, because he was like, who else is going to appreciate this? It was sitting in a drawer somewhere. Um, the watch that started it all, the Hublot Classic Fusion, that was the first brand that I ever worked with. I love that watch. So there's, again, not necessarily a lot of rhyme or reason, but there were different things about it that just spoke to me. Uh, so what am, I, what am I wearing today? I'm wearing two watches. <laughs> and yes, I am representing. I'm representing Parmigiani and H. Moser, who are both clients of mine. But I will caveat that these are my watches. These, I put my money where my mouth is, too. If I, I, I told myself when I started w working with, uh, not working, when I founded Gigantum, that I was going to work with people that I like and product that I believe in. Um, so in the same way that they are patrons of our services, I want to be a patron of their art as well. Um, I asked everybody to bring a watch that is of emotional significance to them. So I invite you at some point of the evening to just talk to the person that's next to you, behind you, in front of you, whatever, and just share that story as to why that's important to you. Watch has changed my life. I'm getting a little emotional. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Fernando, for that incredible lecture. We'll open it up to questions now, so uh, you can come back up. Here, let's turn this microphone on as well, and I'll walk around the audience. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Hello. I was just curious about your grandfather's pocket watch. Mm -hmm. What is it like, you know, and how old is it and everything? It is originally from the 1920s, um, and it's funny because when I first got it, I actually reached out to the brand and I was like, hey, this is the serial number, here are some pictures. And they have a very surprisingly extensive uh, archive. So they were able to tell me um, which retailer bought it, what year it came into Mexico, um, and what year it was purchased. Um, and I believe my grandfather bought it in the 19, early, late 1930s, early 1940s, if I recall correctly. Um, and it's been only in our family's possession since. It was sitting at a retailer for an extensive period of time. What's the brand? Longines. Um, it's, uh, Longines. it's a hunter okay. watch. Yeah. All right. Uh, wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, tying back to what you had started with, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what do we spend our, you know, time and, and money? Mm -hmm. And you know, you indicated like value systems. You know, you deal with brands that you truly believe in. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, one side of the coin is, yes, ad campaigns, you know, touching on the hearts and minds, and okay, congratulations as a watch brand, you've just established your relationship with a new customer. The question that I want to ask is, perhaps the flip side of that coin, perhaps from a branding perspective, could you share your insight into the values in how do brands, or have brands reached out to, how do they sustain that relationship? How do they keep that consumer base entertained and, valued, right? Mm -hmm. So could you go more into like uh, the values that you deem important in, you know, in those brands and how they continue their success in building and outreaching and things like that? Thank you. 
That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I think about it almost as a ripple effect. You know, you throw, you throw a pebble in the water and you have like a small circle and then a bigger one and so on and so forth. Now, I think advertising campaigns to a certain degree are your larger circle, right? They have the most reach, if you will. Uh, more, more people will see it. But again, it's, it's a little bit of a, it's a flash in the pan to a certain degree. You, you flip a magazine or you see a banner ad somewhere or you see a, an out of home um, ad somewhere and, and it's that 30 second that maybe captures enough of your attention but doesn't necessarily tell you that much more, right? Now, it's funny because there's a, a study that says on average it takes the human brain at seven to 10 times seeing something to be able to remember it, seven to 10 times. And most of the times they probably won't even remember where it is that they saw it to begin with. And that's why a 360 degree marketing campaign is so important because that's how you develop that relationship. It's a little bit like dating. You know, you go, maybe you go into like one of those speed dates, I think that's what it is. Speed dates or, or the apps and you're swiping and you're like, oh yeah, that looks good. But then you have to go out for drinks and then maybe you do dinner after. And then maybe you, I don't know, go for the weekend somewhere. But you have to kind of delve in slowly into that relationship. So advertising is to a certain degree the beginning for some. But how you really develop that is also your website. You have to make sure that it, it looks good and has the, the right amount of information and that the flow of information is comfortable enough for people to actually want to spend time there. Uh, social media is probably one of the biggest touch points nowadays. And again, you have to make sure that that messaging and that visual aesthetic is so on point that people want to continue swiping, they want to continue delving. Um, events. Like I said, it's really important not only to talk to people about things, but you have to actually see them in person and ask the questions. Why are you wearing what you do? What do you like about our brand? What could we do better? As customers, we have to talk about our opinions. We have to tell people and, and brands what it is that we're looking for, what it is that we value. It's at the end of the day up to the brands to listen. And that's, I think, also where a big um, difference happens in the brands that are successful versus the brands that are not. You can be on your high horse and think that you know better. Maybe you don't. And look, I, that is not to say that you should always listen to what the customer has to say. You have to have your own opinion. You have to stand for something on your own. And some people will like it and some people won't. But at the end of the day, it's also a conversation. And you can come up with new ideas the more you listen. Um, but I think, again, in order to have a successful relationship with an end client, you have to have different touch points in that journey of discovery. I hope that answered your question. Uh, with regard to emotional connectivity, do you want to just comment on what you've seen change over time since when you entered the business to now, if there's been changes or a lot of things the same. And a related question, are there differences in emotional connectivity with younger buyers versus older buyers? Do you find a difference on what you know, works with the various age groups? Two very good questions. Um, in terms of what has changed, I mean, just the, the sheer amount of information that is out there and the access to that information is something that really until the creation of the internet um, and even more recent years over the past decade that we've really seen expand. Um, I think that is the blessing and the curse, right? Because people can become a lot better educated about not only the product itself, but the brands and what they stand for. Um, that also means that brands have to be a lot more conscious as to the information that they're putting out there. So I would say that that's probably one of the biggest difference that I've seen uh, in the industry. In terms of uh, the different ways of uh, creating that emotional connection, absolutely. I mean, it's about the different ways in which the generations and, again, different people uh, receive information. Uh, communication is not only about the message that you want to put out there, it's also about how that message is being perceived. Um, and that's not just about marketing, you know? Think about any fight that you've had with your significant other. <laughs> it's, I didn't mean it that way, you know, that's not what I said. Again, it's all about perception. Um, we have to meet in the middle somewhere. And yeah, I mean, for example, um, if you look at the way, you know, older generations consume information, a lot of people are still very much about 
paper magazines or newspapers. Uh, then you look at, you know, uh, probably my generation that started getting into the internet, and it's also about web. I'm more of an old school soul, so I still prefer paper, but that's just, you know, the Pisces slash Scorpio in me. Um, and then you look at people that consume data literally just via social media or Twitter. That's their headlines. They don't really care to know what the details are. They just look at that one line and they consider themselves informed. Um, I do see a shift in Gen Z and the, the younger consumers really caring a lot more about the value and the behind the scenes and the, the depth of information. Um, but it's a constant shift. And I think it's incredibly important for brands to continuously communicate with their customers in a way that resonates with their core audience, while at the same time remembering that we're all mortal. So you always have to think about how you're going to talk to the next generation and how you're going to talk to that new buyer. Uh, it's not just about Q4 sales and how that reflects according to last year, right? We have to think ahead of the curve. Where are we going to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Um, and how are people going to uh, consume information and create an emotional connection? Again, what do they value? Where do they spend their energy, their time, and their money on? Greetings. I have a two-part question. Uh, I wanted to get a little insight into what drove you to start your own agency. And I wanted to know if your intention was originally to work with watches or the luxury space. Thank you. Why did I start my own company? Um, at the time, I was trying to think of my next professional move. Uh, and I was looking at different uh, job positions that were, you know, being advertised. And I am, I love to be somewhere long term. Um, I love to see a marketing strategy actually be born, be put into action, and then actually bear fruit, which some people think it's overnight. It's not. You know, it takes years for a seed to actually plant and bear fruit. Uh, so when I was looking at those positions, I couldn't find something that I told myself I could be here for the next five, seven, eight years. Um, so I was like, okay, maybe I just do my own thing. And I told myself, you get six months. You get six months to try to make any sense of this and actually make some money. <laughs> um, and about five months in, four months in, I signed Parmigiani Fleury. And that has been, that's my oldest client, one of the reasons of why I'm wearing one of their watches. Uh, they've been with me for almost eight years. Um, and I told myself, when I start my own company, and I'm going back to something I already mentioned, I only want to work with people that I like and product that I believe in. Uh, now, why watches specifically? Um, to me, they make sense. I think they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, I'm going to toot my own horn a little bit. I, I'm lucky enough that I haven't had to really uh, look for business on my own. A lot of the times it's clients that come to me because of referrals or they were previous clients of mine. Um, so it's also been very organic and I, I would say my biggest niche is watches. Um, but I think, you know, I have experience in also other parts of the luxury industry. I just, I love watches. Yeah. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, one. One of the things I noticed is that uh, there's a significant distinction between the brands that you represent. Mm -hmm. how, how do you go about formulating a marketing campaign um, based upon the brand and, and who you're trying to reach and mm -hmm. bringing in new customers? And, and I mean, all of these watches, I think of Moser and Parmesan Fleurier and, and Grable Forcy, and, the, and they have very different sense of appeal to different customers. How do you kind of build something that, that works for them? Well, the reason of why the brands are so different is, is honestly very strategic. Um, for me, it's about satisfying different elements of my own personality. Um, and also because to me, they're brands that speak to different elements of the watchmaking industry. Um, so that's why I work with such a varied group. Now, when it comes to putting together strategies that are very different and unique to one, each one of them, that's where uh, a good marketing professional really comes in because so many people out there just recycle the same idea over and over again. 
Um, and again, that's something that I didn't want to do. Um, and it's also one of the reasons of why when we work with our clients, we are an extension of them. We're not just the agency that is gonna you know, send you an email once a week and request images for whatever story that they're working on. You're probably gonna get sick from hearing from us. You know, Brett's here, he can probably agree with that. <laughs> he has to say that. Um, so yeah, you have, to, you have to really delve in into what the brands stand for. Um, again, energy, time, money, you have to care. Um, and I think we love what we do. And we love what we do not only because it's fun and it's watches and it's a luxury industry, because for us it's about connecting with people. Um, and again, it's, a, it's about that emotion. Like we are creating emotion for others. Um, I can't tell you exactly how that happens. There's no magic formula. There's no one, two, three, four, five steps that you have to follow to create the correct strategy. Um, it's a lot of nuance. It's a lot of conversations. It's a lot of brainstorming. It's a lot of bad ideas that then maybe turn into good ideas. Um, it's about people. Thank you. Any other questions in the back of the room? No? Oh, yes. OK, back here. You spoke um, about effective marketing. What would you say is the, in your personal opinion, um, the least effective, or what have you personally have witnessed as the worst marketing um, <laughs> campaign strategy? Thank you. You know, that's a good question, because I originally actually had a slide of something that I thought was not great. <laughs> and then I decided to, to remove it, because you know, as parents usually say, if you don't have something nice to say about people, maybe don't say anything. Um, and I won't mention the brand or what it was specifically, but maybe what, I'll, what I will say is um, I don't believe, and I don't think anybody in this room believes in just marketing fluff. It's so easy to pay for something that is inauthentic. Put your logo in this you know, one big event or pay this one really famous person and have them be in a commercial somewhere and that will guarantee you success. I think people, especially nowadays, can see right through it. I think it's extremely obvious when it's a uh, pay-to-play type of uh, you know, activity. Um, so again, I'm not gonna go into the exact details, but there was one commercial in particular that I remember seeing, and it was uh, an actor or an actress, I won't mention who, um, and they were like basically given a script to go over this one particular watch, and they were like, oh, this watch is cool and this watch is special, and it's unique. And I was just sitting there thinking like, aren't you supposed to be a good actor? <laughs> like, I thought this was what you did for a living. <laughs> it did not resonate, it didn't translate because he did not believe. Um, and you could see it. So yeah, that's what I would say is really bad <laughs> example. Maybe a couple more questions, we'll go here and then to the front. Sure. Thank you for the presentation, it was wonderful. Um, do, you, do you find it more challenging to deal with, <clears throat> with a brand that has a very long history and legacy that you might feel compelled to incorporate into the marketing of it, or is it more difficult to provide services to a, a, a newer brand like a Moser that doesn't have you know, a century of history behind it? And what are some of the challenges with both? I honestly don't know that the answer is necessarily relative to the age of the brand. I think it's about the mindset of the people behind the brand. Um, and I'll give you two examples. Um, you know, you have Zenith and you have H. Moser, who are both incredibly historic brands. Um, if you think about H. Moser, they have found their own way of uh, identifying the values of the original founder in Rich Moser and then rethinking of them for today's audience. Um, now, did their history affect their marketing today? Absolutely not, right? They're just, again, representing those values in a new, a fresh voice. Uh, then you have Zenith, who, you know, with the Revival collections, with their Icons collections, um, really focus on their history, their El Primero movement, their search for precision. Very, very different brands in terms of design, in terms of price point, 
But what is similar in both of them is that the teams are interested in new ways of telling their own story. Um, and if you think about what marketing is, let's be real, it's telling the same story over and over and over and over again, but in a way that sounds different and resonates differently throughout time. So your story has to evolve with the brand, with the time that you're in, um, and with the needs of the audience that you're trying to speak to. Um, so again, I don't think it's so much about the brand. Uh, it's about having that kind of fresh perspective and being open to new ideas. And we'll take the last question. Last maybe? question. Yeah. No pressure. Oh, no, that's a lot of pressure. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so uh, part of my question was already answered. So we've already tied into um, some of the worst ad campaigns for some of these watches that shall not be named, right? But again, um, being in your position as on the inside of the industry, could you share some more of that insight into, you know, so we obviously know the stories of some of these brands with very successful campaigns. Mm -hmm. Can we share some more insight into campaigns that might have missed the mark? Where did those companies kind of go wrong and how can those, can insights from like those failure points, like what can, le what lessons could be, could be learned, right? You know, did they misjudge their intended audience? You know, did they, you know, misjudge like the means of reaching out to them? You know, mm -hmm. did they not follow through on customer service or those types of events? You know, um, when you go into building a relationship with a brand that you believe in, you know, have there been cases where, you know, they started out great and then just kind of fall through in the second half? Could you just like share some additional insight you know, into that? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that happens with any brand and any relationship, right? There's going to be your ups and downs. And look, we provide a certain opinion and we provide our expertise, um, but the client gets to choose the things that they do or don't activate. Um, to a certain degree, you know, the CEO, the executive committees, they have maybe a vision that sometimes we don't have, you know, whether it's five, 10 years, um, you know, ahead of the curve. Um, I think where people really miss the mark, and I'm not gonna give one, uh, one example necessarily, but I think where people miss the mark is that they think that, again, advertising or a PR story or something like that is the end of the road, and it's not. You still have to, again, connect with that one person individually. Um, if they comment on social media, hey, this is a beautiful watch, or hey, what's the price? It's not enough to just respond and say, here's the price. DM them. Hey, I see that you're interested. What can I do to help? Would you like to come see it in person? I see that you're based in Denver. Here's a retailer in the area. Let me put you in touch with them. It's that human connection that makes all the difference. Um, so I think, in my opinion, it's not about one particular example of where people miss the mark, I think in general, and not just the watch industry, but as, as a luxury industry and products in general, um, sometimes brands tend to just kind of blanket statement or just look for whatever is like the wider reach and they think, oh, if you build it, they will come. No, <laughs> you have to invite them. <laughs> Okay, let's, let's give Fernanda another hand. Thank you again, Fernanda. And thank you for all uh, uh, coming out tonight. Uh, have a great rest of the year. We'll see you in the new year. See you in January. And don't forget our uh, holiday gift shop is open after the lecture as well. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.